probably speak really fast. The talk will be over in like 25 minutes. <laughs> So I'd uh, like to thank the organizers for the, the opportunity to, to speak here today. Uh, I, I remember back a handful of years ago being at the, the first year junior retreat, uh, being just like a wee little graduate student, and uh, just kind of the, the fact that I've been invited to speak at this retreat, it, it makes me feel like I made it to the big league. So uh, this is really awesome. Uh, so, so thank you. Um, so everything I want to tell you about today is uh, joint work with both Daryl Cooper uh, and Ariel Leitner. Uh, and in a sense, the stuff I want to tell you about is, is kind of complementary to uh, the sort of things that Fanny was talking about this morning. Um, so what I want to tell you about is a, a class of uh, projective manifolds that naturally occur as ends of uh, properly convex manifolds, uh, but not the kind that act uh, co-compactly on any sort of properly convex set. So that, that's sort of the rough setting. Uh, and we're going to see that these are, are kind of naturally analogs of, uh, of finite volume hyperbolic manifolds. Um, so the talk is going to kind of have, uh, have three main parts. So the first part, we're going to kind of go over uh, what do cusps of finite volume hyperbolic manifolds look like. Uh, in particular, we're going to focus on their geometry, uh, and we're going to focus on kind of what their moduli space looks like, and we'll see that the moduli space is kind of nicely behaved. Um, next, we'll, we'll do a quick uh, introduction to, to properly convex manifolds. Uh, we'll see that these are a nice generalization of hyperbolic manifolds, uh, but because of a lack of Mostow rigidity, uh, they're, they're much more flexible. Uh, and, and we'll sort of see how you can deform examples to, to get properly convex manifolds. Uh, and then finally, uh, we'll, we'll introduce generalized cusps and, and, and sort of uh, see that in a lot of ways, they're similar to uh, cusps of finite volume hyperbolic manifolds in terms of their structure. Uh, but they present a lot more uh, uh, sort of interesting properties. In, in particular, they have a kind of more complicated moduli space, uh, and they also have some uh, interesting uh, transitional phenomenon that I'll talk about towards the end. Um, so to get started, I, I want to talk about a, a slightly different projective model of hyperbolic space. Um, so this, this is going to sort of serve as a prototype for the, the types of domains that we're going to be talking about later. So I want to think about projective space is, is kind of given as the epigraph of some convex function. So you can, uh, this is, I guess it doesn't point. Well, it's OK. Uh, so you can sort of see that I, I'm going to take a, a, a foliation of Rn into both a, a vertical one-dimensional direction and a sort of complementary horizontal direction. And I'm going to think about hyperbolic space as the epigraph of a convex function, one half the like, norm squared of the horizontal factor. Um, and so this gives a, a projective model of hyperbolic space that's in, in some ways very analogous to the upper half space model uh, in, in the sense that it's very good at studying isometries that sort of fix a point on the boundary. Um, so in, in this model, uh, G to, because it's a projective model, geodesics are, are just going to be straight affine lines. Uh, and the isometry group uh, of hyperbolic space in this setting is just going to correspond to all of the projective maps that sort of preserve this, uh, this picture. And it has a nice metric uh, that, that Fanny mentioned briefly in her talk uh, called the Hilbert metric. Uh, and the way you can decide the distance between two points is you just draw the, the straight line between them and look at where it intersects the boundary. And this will give you four points on a projective line. Uh, and you can just take one half the log of the cross ratio. Uh, so in this setting, we have uh, so, some extra structure. Uh, we get a co-dimension one foliation by strictly convex hypersurfaces that are, that are traditionally called horospheres. Uh, and in this model, they're very easy to describe. They're just level sets uh, kind of of that function that I described above. So if you, if you sort of just fix the value uh, that you want that function to take on, uh, you, you'll get one of these. There's also a secondary foliation by lines uh, that just look vertical in this picture. Uh, and these lines in, in sort of hyperbolic geometry turn out to be uh, orthogonal. Uh, so they don't really look orthogonal in this picture. Uh, but it's because, uh, oh, yours works much better. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, but the, the, these are actually uh, orthogonal lines because we, we don't have a, a conformal model. Uh, the, the sort of price you pay for having straight-looking lines is that you don't have, I don't know, Euclidean-looking angles. Um, <clears throat> and, and it turns out that you can describe the metric on each of these horospheres very nicely uh, because you have this orthogonal foliation. 
uh, essentially the, the sort of second fundamental form on these horse spheres is just going to be given to you by the Hessian of that function up there. So it's, it's just going to be the sort of standard flat metric. Uh, and in this setting, you have uh, a couple of nice groups that you can describe affinely. Uh, so there's this group that I'll call T, um, consisting of these, these upper triangular matrices. And uh, they may look kind of confusing at first, but what you should really focus on is the sort of uh, lower right-hand block. So this is how these matrices are going to act in this sort of horizontal direction. And what you can see is sort of affinely, they're just acting by translation by this vector u. Uh, and you should think about the stuff kind of in the top row is just the, is what you have to have there in order to have this group preserve the foliation by horospheres. Uh, so this is sort of a group of translations in the uh, Euclidean metric. Uh, and then also you have this group uh, O, uh, and again you should sort of focus on what happens down here. Uh, in the horizontal direction, this is just going to act as some uh, like rotation uh, in the horizontal direction. <clears throat> um, and, and these groups have some, some nice properties. Uh, in particular, if you take the group generated by them, uh, this is going to be sort of some, some sort of internal uh, semi-direct product, uh, and you're going to end up getting all of the isometries uh, of the horospheres. So, so this is some, some nice geometry that we have in this setting. Uh, and we're going to see that, um, that, that in, in, for, for hyperbolic cusps, this, this sort of geometry kind of descends to uh, nice quotients. So let, let's change gears a teeny bit. So let's take a, a, a lattice in the isometry group of Hn. Uh, and if we take the quotient of hyperbolic space by this, we're going to get some, uh, some hyperbolic orbifold. And I, I have a nice thick, thin decomposition that's going to sort of topologically uh, allow me to decompose the quotient into some simple pieces. Uh, there's going to be a, a compact piece uh, that I guess we'll call uh, MK. Uh, forget about this. Uh, so it's, it's compact. I don't know much else about it. Uh, and then I'm going to have a, 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 a disjoint union of, uh, of cusps. Uh, and each of these cusps is going to be uh, topologically just finitely covered by a, uh, a torus uh, cross array. Uh, but we can actually say much more about the geometry of the cusp. So I want to kind of remind you about uh, what the geometry looks like. So if you start with a, a horrible in uh, hyperbolic space, so this is just sort of the sort of super level set of, uh, uh, of one of these, these horospheres, and, and you take a lattice in that group that I had on the, on the previous slide, then uh, your cusp can just be realized as a quotient of this horrible by that lattice. Uh, and in, because the, the lattice group preserves all this structure, it preserves this foliation by horospheres and this foliation by vertical lines, uh, all of this structure is going to descend to the quotient. So uh, the, the cusps are going to be foliated by strictly convex Euclidean manifolds. Uh, and then you also have this sort of foliation by lines that, that, that uh, go out the cusps. And so this is the kind of structure to, to keep in mind. Uh, that we're going to see persists when we start doing uh, a nice family of deformations. Um, <clears throat> all right, so that's the, the sort of geometry of uh, cusps and finite volume manifolds. Uh, the next thing that I want to talk about is their moduli space. Uh, so it turns out that in the right setting, it's pretty easy to parameterize these things. So uh, I'm going to be dealing with marked structures. So what a marked torus cusp is, is a, it's a cusp like I had on the, the previous slide, along with an identification of it uh, with a, a, a torus across an interval. So this is sort of a similar picture to what one might be doing in Teichmuller theory. Uh, and, and you want to think about these types of marked structures up to a natural equivalence. Uh, you you want to consider two marked cusps to be equivalent uh, if their markings differ uh, up to isotopy by a, a, an isometry. Uh, so this sort of sort of standard commutative diagram that you see in, in Teichmuller space. Uh, and, and sort of in, in, in homage to, to Teichmuller space, we're going to call uh, this, this fractor T the space of equivalence classes of, uh, of marked uh, structures on cusps. And what we really want to do uh, is we want to want to topologize this space. Uh, you can sort of do it using some compact C infinity topology on markings. Uh, and and this, this might start to sound like it's maybe a confusing space, but we'd like to parameterize it in kind of a concrete way. Uh, and this turns out to be pretty easy to do. So how do you do it? Uh, first thing you do is you, you pick a basis uh, for the, the, that translational group that I talked about before. And this is, just, this is just isomorphic to a real vector space, so you, you pick some basis. And then you use your marking. Uh, you just apply it to the sort of standard set of generators in uh, the fundamental group of the, uh, uh, of the torus cross interval manifold. And that's going to give you a second uh, basis. And so what you can do is you can sort of write down a matrix that sort of allows you to relate the first basis to the second one. Uh, and you might wonder, well, what happens if I picked an equivalent marking? Uh, 
well, the, the, the different markings are going to differ by Euclidean similarities. And so you can use the, the homothety part to sort of scale your matrix down to have uh, determinant one. Uh, and then you can sort of say that this, this sort of Teichmuller space of structures is just going to be uh, sort of equivalence classes of, uh, of matrices of determinant plus or minus one that sort of give you the, the lattice part. Uh, but you have to declare two of them to be equivalent if they differ by a rotation. Uh, so this is sort of a standard uh, description of the space of cusps, uh, at least torus cusps, in, in hyperbolic manifolds. Uh, and again, uh, our, our goal is going to be to sort of generalize this, this kind of picture. OK. So let's move, uh, move on to talking a bit about properly convex geometry uh, so we can sort of generalize these, these hyperbolic structures that we, we've mentioned. So if I take projective space, there's, there's a lot of ways to decompose it into a, an affine piece uh, and a projective piece of a lower dimension. And so the way you should interpret this is, is saying is that if you take any hyperplane in projective space and you remove it, what you're going to be left with is an affine uh, space. And, and we're going to call any, any uh, affine space that we can realize in this way an affine patch. So we're going to be interested in a, a particular type of subset of projective space, namely the, the properly convex ones. And so what a properly convex set is, is it's a, a set of projective space that lives inside of some affine patch. Uh, and in fact, it's, its closure also lives in there. Uh, and, and in that affine patch, it just looks like a, a nice convex set. Um, so it turns out that, that being properly convex is just the same thing as being some bounded convex subset of an affine patch. Uh, so basically, you, you can kind of just draw your favorite convex uh, set in, in affine space. And this is going to give you an example of a, a properly convex set. So whenever you have a, a properly convex set, it, it comes with a group, uh, namely the, the group of automorphisms, so the, the projective maps that, that send this set to itself. Uh, and so I have a couple of examples, uh, two of which we've seen. Uh, the first one is a, a copy of, just a copy of hyperbolic space. And so the, the group of projective automorphisms is just going to be the, the full isometry group of hyperbolic space. Uh, the one in the middle, the, the triangle, also has a fairly large group of, uh, of automorphisms. Uh, Fanny uh, talked a little bit about it in her talk. Uh, you, you can sort of see how if you think about the vertices of this triangle as just being the standard basis elements uh, in, your, in a vector space, then the diagonal group is going to act naturally on the triangle. Uh, and then you also have to semi-direct that with uh, the symmetric group the, on three elements that sort of permutes the, the vertices. So, so this also has a, a, a pretty big group of automorphisms. Uh, but it turns out if you just kind of randomly draw some, some convex set, it, it's not going to have a lot of uh, automorphisms. So if I, this, this sort of more irregular looking domain that I've drawn on the right is, is going to have a, a trivial uh, automorphism group. And so th these are going to be the types of sets that we want to model uh, some manifolds on. We're going to want to try to take some interesting quotients of these. Um, and I guess, as I mentioned a moment ago, generically, the, the group you get is going to be trivial. So, what is the class of manifolds that we're going to want to be working with? Uh, they're what we'll call properly convex manifolds. And this is just going to be a quotient of a properly convex set uh, by some uh, discrete subgroup of its uh, projective automorphism group. Uh, and typically, we want, want this to be torsion free. Um, if you relax that hypothesis, you, you may end up getting orbifolds. Uh, but just for psychological reasons, let's, let's stay in the category of manifolds. So, uh, a, a question you might ask yourself is, well, are, are there lots of interesting properly convex manifolds? And, and maybe at the beginning you're kind of skeptical that there are lots of these things because I just told you that kind of generically uh, the, the groups that you're going to be allowed to glue these things up with are, are, are trivial. Uh, but it turns out that there are, are lots of examples, um, and we've sort of seen a few of them. Uh, the first large class of examples uh, is, is complete uh, hyperbolic manifolds. Uh, so hyperbolic space can be realized as a, a properly convex set, and it has a rather large group of projective automorphisms, and so uh, we can get interesting quotients in this way. Um, and then as, as Fanny talked about in, in her talk a little while ago, a good way to get non-hyperbolic examples is by doing some, some sort of deformation uh, type of construction. Uh, so I want to talk a, a little bit more about this, this deformation construction that, that one can do in this setting. Uh, so there's a very nice theorem uh, from like the 1950s of Kozel. Uh, and, and what Kozel tells you is that if you start with a closed properly convex manifold, uh, so you can realize it as a quotient uh, of some properly convex set by a nice group, uh, 
and you sort of deform the, the fundamental group inside of uh, the projective general linear group, uh, sort of in such a way that the, the relations are continue to be satisfied, then essentially what happens is the, the, uh, there's a properly convex set that kind of comes along for the ride. So not only can you, so it's, it's telling if you can algebraically deform the group, then you can sort of geometrically deform the, the domain uh, to come along for the ride. Uh, and, and it turns out that you can actually relax the, the hypotheses of this theorem a little bit um, to, to uh, make some conclusions about non-closed manifolds, uh, but you have to be a little bit careful. Uh, so so as, as Fanny mentioned, if you, if you start relaxing uh, uh, your hypotheses too much, you, you'll end up in a, in a class of, of representations that don't have nice stability properties. Uh, so so you, have to, you, you have to sort of have some control over the, the geometry of the ends of your manifold if you, if you want to have a nice sort of deformation theory. But, but it turns out under appropriate hypotheses, uh, you, you can have a nice relative version of this theorem. And uh, so, so using the, these theorems and, and some sort of a bending construction, uh, you can actually produce non-hyperbolic examples of properly convex manifolds. So this, is, this was done in the, in, in the closed setting uh, by Benoit, uh, and then in the, in the non-compact setting uh, by Ludovic Marquis. Uh, so just to maybe give you kind of a cartoon picture of, of what a deformation like this looks like, uh, so let's sort of start with a, we, we can start with a square uh, in the plane, and what I can do is, is, is I can think about a, uh, I can think about a hyperbolic isometry that sort of glues the left side of this to the right, and another one that glues the bottom to the top, uh, and if I take the group generated by that, uh, by some ping pong argument, I'll get a free subgroup of, of isometries, and then if I just sort of look at what that does to this square, I'm going to get a nice tiling of, uh, of hyperbolic two space. And so what happens is if I, if I tweak the gluings a little bit, so I, I, I change the, the way in which the left side is glued to the right side and the bottom is glued to the top uh, in, in such a way that it no longer lives in, in uh, PO21, uh, then w what's going to happen is uh, I'll get a new group. It'll, it'll continue to be a free group. Uh, and the, the sort of tiling I get is going to be of some more irregular looking convex set. So this is kind of the, the idea about how you, you can produce examples. OK. So now that we have a little bit of background in what properly convex manifolds are, I want to start talking about what generalized cusps are and why they're a, a good class of manifolds to, to think about. So if you, if you start with a, a non-compact uh, finite volume hyperbolic manifold, uh, and you do a small properly convex deformation of it, uh, so maybe I convinced you that those exist, maybe I didn't, uh, but they do. Uh, so a question you might ask is, well, what, what sort of geometry does the, does the end have? So we, we sort of understood very well in the hyperbolic setting what the geometry looked like. And we'd like to now start to understand it when we start doing deformations. Uh, and the somewhat silly answer is, well, it's, it's a generalized cusp, uh, but that doesn't mean anything until I tell you what one is. Um, so what is a generalized cusp? Well, it's, it's a certain type of properly convex manifold. So topologically, what it is, is it, it looks like a, a compact hypersurface cross a, array. And then more geometrically, uh, the, the sort of realization, the, the, these, uh, the, these sort of uh, hypersurfaces can be realized uh, sort of as, as strictly convex subsets uh, of omega. So really what I mean by this is if you sort of lift this, this foliation to, uh, to omega, what you're going to see is, is some things that sort of locally look like graphs of, of com, uh, convex functions. And then finally, you have an algebraic condition on the fundamental group. Uh, you, you insisted it be virtually nilpotent. Um, and, and if you do a little bit of work, you, you end up seeing that this ends up implying that the, the groups in question are virtually abelian. So if, if it makes you more comfortable, you, can, you could just assume all along that the, the groups were, were virtually abelian. <clears throat> so in this setting, there, there's some questions that we want to, to answer. So if you start with one of these generalized cusps, you want to, first off, maybe get a feel for what, what is the sort of universal cover look like. Uh, what, what, what can you say about that? Uh, also, you might want to know if you can say anything about what, what does the group uh, that you're questioning out by look like. Uh, and then finally, you might want to ask, like, what, what sort of geometry does the, the quotient have? Um, and then lastly, uh, a question we'll, we'll address is sort of what does, the, what does the moduli space of cusps look like? So essentially, we want to 
answer all of these questions in, in similar ways to, uh, to what we did for finite volume, uh, or sorry, cusps of finite volume hyperbolic manifolds. So this is sort of the, the, the questions we want to answer. Uh, and, and I want to kind of give you an overview of what the answer ends up being uh, before we start talking about some of the details. So if we have an n-dimensional uh, set like this, uh, what we're going to get uh, is we're going to get a, a slightly a smaller domain uh, that's going to have a nicer boundary. And instead of just being strictly convex, it'll actually be smooth. Uh, we're going to get a, a foliation of that domain by uh, convex hypersurfaces uh, that are going to behave very much like horospheres, uh, and another transverse foliation by uh, concurrent lines. So it's going to look similar to the hyperbolic picture in that setting. Uh, we're going to be able to use this structure to endow the horospheres with, uh, with a flat metric uh, by some affine version of the second fundamental form. Uh, and we're going to have a, a foliation preserving group that, that sort of algebraically looks similar uh, to, to the hyperbolic case. There, there's going to be sort of an abelian translational part, uh, semi direct producted with a, a point stabilizer that, that kind of acts like rotations in this metric. Uh, but it's going to be a, a little bit different in the sense that you might not get the sort of full group of rotations. So in, for, for, uh, for, for hyperbolic cusps, you could uh, quotient out by, by arbitrary rotations. Uh, but what we're going to see is for these generalized cusps, they're, they're kind of, uh, they're less isotropic. And so there's not, you're not going to be able to do all possible rotations. Uh, so this is a, a kind of the, the general picture. Uh, so let's start diving into some specific examples. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with a, a collection of numbers, uh, all positive, that are ordered increasingly. And I'm going to use these numbers to construct a, a properly convex set. Uh, and, and it's going to have the same sort of vertical horizontal uh, structure that I had before. So I'm going I'm to define this domain as the epigraph of some convex function. So what's happening here is the, the vertical coordinate is just going to be larger than uh, the value of some convex function that I get from taking this weighted sum of, of logarithms of, of the horizontal coordinates. And uh, sort of a, a picture of what something like this is, is going to look like is, is just this, this, this guy here. So I mean, like a, a one-dimensional version of this would just be the graph of y equals minus log x. Um, and so there's a natural foliation by this, by, by just taking sort of level sets of, of this convex function, it's just the, exactly the same as there was in the, the hyperbolic setting. Uh, there's also a foliation by vertical lines. And then there's uh, some groups that are going to preserve all of this nice structure. Uh, and, and they're going to behave kind of similarly. So, so again, you should just focus on what's happening in the sort of lower left block. So here, uh, what, what's happening in the horizontal direction is this group is going to act by dilations in the, in the coordinate directions. Uh, and then the stuff in the top row is just whatever you need to have there. Uh, in order to ensure that these foliations are preserved. But what we should really be thinking about is that this group is acting by dilation in the, the horizontal direction. Uh, and then I also have a, a sort of analog of the orthogonal group. Uh, this time it's going to be generated by uh, sort of horizontal coordinate permutations, uh, but not all of them. I'm only allowed to permute coordinates where the lambda values were the same. Because uh, in, in a sense, if I have different values of, of lambda, uh, those directions are not going to be kind of projectively equivalent, so you shouldn't expect there to be a, a, a projective map that takes one to the other. And so then uh, if, I, if I take a, a lattice uh, in, in the group generated by this translation and, and rotation group, uh, what I'm going to get is a, a generalized cusp. Uh, and you can sort of see that I'll, I'll get some sort of quotient. In this case, it's just going to be some sort of properly convex cylinder uh, in, in this picture. Uh, but in higher dimensions, I could get more complicated things. Um, and so I, I think I'm going to skip talking about the, the sort of chirality here, but maybe the, 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 short, uh, the short takeaway is that the, these, these types of domains have interesting properties. So I mean, for a, for a finite volume manifold, you, you couldn't have a, a curve that sort of spiraled off to the boundary like this. Uh, so like if you sort of look at what this purple curve does in the, in the quotient, it sort of spirals off to the boundary. But interestingly enough, if you start taking a, a curve that sort of spirals in the opposite direction, it'll always sort of come back to a compact part of the manifold. So in some sense, this, this quotient knows that it's right-handed. It, 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 it sort of it has a handedness to it, uh, which is kind of weird. Uh, 
Uh, all right, so that was one flavor of, of cusps. Uh, another flavor is, is what I'll call uh, mixed cusps. So basically this is a, a product of a, a quasi-hyperbolic cusp and, and, and one of the standard ones coming from hyperbolic geometry. Uh, so now I, I have a list of numbers, but I'm going to allow some of them to be zero. Uh, and I'm, I'm gonna call P the number of them that are, are zero and S the, the sort of complementary number. And so again, I'm, I'm gonna have some, uh, some functions. So this is gonna look kind of complicated. Uh, so on, in the directions where, that are corresponding to the zero values, I, I'm gonna have a convex function that looks like uh, one half norm squared. Uh, and then in the non-zero directions, I'm gonna have this weighted sum of, of uh, logarithms. And uh, so this is gonna give me some function. And then I'm gonna define a, a, a properly convex set as just the, the epigraph of, the, of this function. So it, it's gonna have certain directions that look like uh, hyperbolic planes of, of lower dimensions, and then it's gonna have certain directions that look like these kind of quasi-hyperbolic guys. So it's, it, so I, I've drawn kind of a couple of pictures. So if you have, uh, if you have the numbers zero and one, you're, you're gonna get this domain on the left, and you can sort of see that it's, that it's sort of foliated in one direction by, uh, by sort of parabolas uh, that are gonna be copies of H2, uh, and then kind of in the transverse direction, it's gonna be foliated by these kind of logarithm domains. Uh, and then on the right, if, if you have a, a different domain corresponding to the numbers one, one, and, and sort of in every direction, that guy is, is quasi-hyperbolic. Uh, so these are some examples. Uh, again, uh, there's going to be a, a, a nice group uh, kind of, of, of translations. Uh, but in this case, it's going to be mixed, so I guess it's maybe what you would guess, sort of in the, in the vertical, or sorry, in the horizontal direction, you have this, this, this matrix over here, and it's gonna be translating in the uh, sort of hyperbolic directions and uh, dilating in the quasi-hyperbolic directions. Uh, and then again, you're going to have some sort of point stabilizer group, but it's gonna be a little bit more complicated this time. Uh, so you can kind of do arbitrary orthogonal transformations in the hyperbolic directions, uh, but then you can only do coordinate permutations where the coordinates agree in the other direction. So it's, it really is sort of a, a product of, of these previous examples. And again, you, you just take some lattice in this, uh, in this group and, and that's gonna give you an example of a, of a generalized cusp. Um, and then the final uh, type of example that I wanna talk about is sort of the, the diagonalizable example. So now I'm gonna have n numbers, all of which are positive and I'm going to define a, a, a properly convex domain uh, by taking a, sort of a, the epigraph of some, some slightly different convex function uh, where now I just have uh, weighted sums of logarithms. Uh, and again, there's a, there's a foliation by level sets uh, and a foliation by lines, but this time the lines are, are all concurrent to zero. They're not, they're not uh, vertical. Um, <clears throat> And there's a nice group that acts in this picture, and this time it, it's going to be diagonal. So we're gonna end up having uh, all diagonal matrices, essentially where the, uh, where the eigenvalues, the logs of the eigenvalues sort of satisfy the same weighted sum of logarithms uh, that you had before. And this is just the, this condition is just to ensure that this foliation is, is going to be preserved. Uh, and then again, there's, there's sort of an orthogonal group that's going to act by uh, permutations uh, in the coordinate directions where you have the weights being the same. And again, it's the exact same picture. You take some lattice in here, uh, you take the quotient of this picture uh, by that lattice, and, and you'll get an example of a generalized cusp. Uh, so maybe now you're, you're getting sick of the examples, uh, and I have good news for you, this is all of them. Uh, so th there's sort of a, a big picture that comes from, from these examples. Uh, so if you, if, if you take sort of set in uh, Rn, uh, consisting of, of, of increasingly ordered uh, non-negative numbers, um, then essentially from all of the examples that I just talked about, you, you, for, for each choice of, uh, of an element in this, this vial chamber, uh, you're, you're gonna get a domain. Uh, so if you, if you sort of think back through the, the slides, uh, every possible choice was, is in there. So you'll, you'll get a properly convex domain. Um, and the sort of geometry depends on where in this like vial chamber you live. Uh, so if you're in the interior, uh, all the numbers are positive and you get the diagonalizable examples. Um, and then otherwise you're gonna get uh, the, these mixed examples. And so the, the sort of idea is the higher uh, co-dimensional face that you live in, uh, the more uh, sort of hyperbolic, like the more hyperbolic directions you have. Uh, and so if you get down to the, the sort of the, the, the point where all of the, the entries are zero, you, you've sort of recovered 
uh, hyperbolic geometry. Um, so that, that's kind of the rough idea. Uh, and for each of these domains, we've seen that we can produce a pair of foliations. Um, and I haven't really talked very much about this, but you can use these foliations to, to endow the, the horospheres with a, with a, a flat metric. Uh, I have talked about how you, you get a group uh, that preserves these uh, horospheres, uh, and it turns out that that group will preserve the, the metric that I'm not telling you about. Uh, and so um, you get the, this, these nice collections of groups. Um, and there, there's sort of a slight over-parameterization that, that's happening here. Uh, it, it turns out that if you, if you have two elements of the, the vowel chamber that differ by scaling, um, then actually really you're, you're, getting, the same, uh, you're getting the same domain uh, up to projective equivalence. Uh, but, but it turns out that for, for parameterization purposes in a little bit, th this, is, this is actually kind of useful. So uh, now that we have this, this setting, uh, I, I can describe for you the, the kind of main classification theorem that, that I was able to prove with uh, Daryl and Ariel. So what does it say? It says if you have a, a generalized cusp, then what you're going to be able to produce from that is an element of this uh, vial chamber. Uh, it's going to be unique up to scaling. Um, and what you're going to be able to do is you're going to be able to conjugate uh, the fundamental group of your generalized cusp into one of these uh, Lee groups that I, that I kind of described for you. And the uh, generalized cusp you started with is going to sort of deformation retract along uh, th this foliation onto one of these nice domains. So kind of a cartoon of the, uh, of the picture is, well, maybe you start with uh, this, this red domain that has a sort of strictly convex but not smooth boundary. Um, and then sort of sitting inside of there, you'll, you'll be able to find a sort of smooth uh, uh, or you'll be able to find a, a smaller, properly convex domain uh, with smooth boundaries. So, I mean, essentially, you, you like take a piece of sandpaper and just sort of sand down the rough edges. Um, and and the, the generalized cusp you get is going to be a, a quotient of, of this blue guy uh, by, by this, this conjugated group. So, so really, you can sort of retract your, your manifold onto this thing with nice smooth boundary. Um, all right, so uh, kind of in the remaining time, I, I want to talk about some, some moduli kinds of problems. Um, so again, you can define the, the moduli space of, uh, of generalized cusps. And, and just to sort of keep things simple, uh, I, I want to think about the case where the, the cross sections are, are tori. Uh, so a marked generalized torus cusp is just a, a pair consisting of a, of a generalized cusp whose quotient is a torus, uh, along with some sort of identification. Um, and we're, we're going to sort of think about these things uh, in equivalence classes uh, in, in the sort of same way we did for, uh, for cusps and hyperbolic manifolds. We want to consider two of them to be equivalent if the markings differ by, a, in this case, a projective map. Um, and so then we're going to call this, this scripts or uh, fractor C the, the space of equivalence classes. And, and again, you can topologize this using some, some weird compact open topology on, on, on markings. But what you should really like is a, a more concrete way to describe this space. Uh, and that's what I, I want to sort of briefly describe to you. Uh, and, and sort of with the, the setup we have, it, it turns out to be pretty easy to, to parameterize these things. So let's just sort of remind ourselves about what, what you have in the, in the hyperbolic setting. So if you want to parameterize uh, just, just torus cusps in, in hyperbolic manifolds, this is sort of the setup you have. You start with a marked torus cusp. Uh, you can realize it as a quotient of a horrible. Uh, this gives you, you, you pick a basis of the translation group, and then the marking gives you another basis, and you can, use a, you can, you can sort of get a matrix from this construction. The different uh, matrices you get are going to sort of differ by, by multiplication by a, a rotation, and that's how you parameterize the space. So let, let's see what changes uh, in the properly convex setting. So now we're going to start with a, a marked generalized torus cusp. And we've seen from the, the theorem that you can realize this as a, a quotient of, uh, of this, this collection of, of properly convex domains that I've told you about. Uh, and now the, the, the group that you have is going to be a subgroup uh, of one of these translational groups uh, th that I described in the earlier part of the talk. Uh, so you can pick uh, a basis uh, for each of these translation groups. Uh, and, and if you do this kind of carefully, you can show, like, you can show that you can actually pick these bases in a way that depends continuously on this parameter lambda. Uh, 
And so then if you have a marked generalized torus cusp, you'll, you'll actually get a unimodular basis. Uh, you, you can get a unimodular basis for, uh, for Rn. And, and, and this is why you have to have that scaling built into the construction. So I told you that if you had, if you had different elements of the vial chamber that differed by, by scaling, uh, they gave you projectively equivalent uh, domains. And, and, and it turns out there's a, a single choice. So, so for, if someone hands you a cusp, there's a, a sort of single choice of, uh, of lambda for which the, the sort of marked basis you get is going to be unimodular with respect to this nice choice of, of bases. And so then uh, instead of uh, equivalent cusps differing by Euclidean similarities, uh, we, we see that the, the generalized cusps are going to differ by uh, one of these sort of rotations, this, this group uh, O lambda. There was maybe some sort of small, smaller uh, version of, of a group of rotations. And so if you put all this information together, what you see is uh, in order to recover a, a generalized cusp, you need two pieces of information. Uh, you need a, a point in the vial chamber that kind of tells you the, the domain. Uh, and then you need kind of an equivalence class of, of lattices uh, in, the, in the translation group where the sort of equivalence you're taking is, is up to, to rotation. Um, so, uh, I mean, I have to put this, this sort of product in, in quotation marks because the, the thing on the right-hand side kind of depends on the, the point on the left-hand side. So I guess, so technically this is some sort of vibration, but it's kind of nice to think about it just as, as a product. Uh, so this is sort of the, the moduli space of, of cusp. So it's sort of a, so instead of just having, a, so, so I mean, this is sort of the piece you would think about having in the classical situation. Uh, where the, the, the point that you have in the vial chamber, the, the closed vial chamber is just kind of the origin. Uh, so in, in that sense, you can recover the, the parameterization of, of, of cusps in hyperbolic manifolds. Okay. Um, so in the, the sort of remaining uh, time that I have, uh, I, I want to talk about some, some interesting transitional phenomena that, uh, that, that can occur in the, in the setting of generalized cusps. So if I have a, a, a sequence of, of marked uh, torus cusps, uh, I can get some, some data from this, this parameterization that I, that I just described. Uh, and and let, let's suppose that I, I take a, a limit of, of, of some data like this, uh, where when I look at the, the vial chamber data, uh, there's some non-zero coordinate that's starting to tend to zero. So, so maybe geometrically what's happening is you have a you have a, a sequence of, of uh, points in this file chamber that in the limit are going to a higher co-dimension face. So maybe I start off in the interior and I'm going to one of the walls, or maybe I'm sort of degenerating from a higher dimensional wall into a sort of lower dimensional wall. So this is, this is the sort of picture that I want to think about. So what I want to convince you of is that in, in the limit, if you, if you sort of take a limit, the, the cusps you're getting uh, from, from this parameterization are going to, in a sense, transition. So, so really their geometry is going to change rather abruptly when you, when you take a limit. And there are kind of two perspectives uh, that, that, that are basically equivalent uh, that can kind of explain what's happening here. Uh, the first one is, is kind of a, a geometric perspective uh, that has to do with the fact that we have non-compact manifolds. Uh, so in a, in a sense, because you have a, a non-compact manifold, um, like large compact parts of it can look very different. I mean, so I mean, I mean, I, maybe that statement doesn't have any content right now, but uh, so, so the, the, it's really a consequence of the fact that we were using this compact C infinity topology on markings to, to do things. Um, and, and then there's another algebraic perspective that, that has to do with non-Hausdorff uh, behavior of, of a certain character variety. Uh, and so I want to kind of explain these two different perspectives. Uh, so I want to start with kind of a, the geometric perspective. And, and, and there's kind of a nice example that you can keep in mind. Uh, so I'm going to start with a lattice in one of my generalized cusp Lie groups uh, that I, that, that, that's uh, sort of G0B. Uh, so I, I'm going to really just take the group generated by this one particular, I keep forgetting which one is the actual pointer. Uh, generated by this one particular uh, matrix. Uh, and what I want to think about is, is what's happening in this picture as I let, the, as I let B tend to 0. Um, so in this picture, uh, so, so maybe this is at like time 1, what I've drawn for you is kind of a bunch of, uh, I've drawn the domain and I've drawn like some fundamental domains for the, for, for the action of this cyclic group. 
And so I want to start thinking about what happens as b starts tending to 0. So I start getting, uh, I start getting different looking uh, cusp domains. And you can sort of see that this, uh, th this sort of dilation uh, here as b starts tending to 0 is going to sort of start to decay. Uh, and so you can sort of start to see the, the fundamental domains are going to start to bunch up on one another. I mean, so there's only, only finitely many of them you can draw, but they're just going to start bunching up on each other. Uh, and in the limit, I, I'm going to get this sort of vertical looking domain where um, my, my group element is sort of, has converged to a vertical translation. And so in the limit, it, it's look, it looks like I'm not getting a generalized cusp. Like this, this thing on the, that, that I've drawn on the right view isn't even properly convex. So it, it sort of looks like what, what's happening is that I'm getting some convergence to something that's not even a generalized cusp. Uh, but you have to realize that, uh, that, that you have to be working with uh, not, not just marked structures, but equivalences of, of marked structures. So in order to sort of see this as a, a family of generalized cusps, you might have to apply a, a family of projective transformations. And that's exactly what you can do. So l let's think about a, a certain projective transformation. Uh, so, so let's kind of think geometrically about what a, a map like this is going to do. So for, for values of b that are very close to zero, the, the sort of part down here is going to be a very large translation in the horizontal direction. And then essentially the, the stuff up here is going to give you sort of a, a large scaling in the, in the vertical direction. So that, that's what this map is going to do. So it's going to do a kind of a large translation in one direction and a large scaling. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to conjugate my original group by this family of projective maps. Uh, and, and what happens is, is I'm going to get some much nicer behavior. So essentially, I, I've kind of introduced some non-zero entries uh, into my matrix. Uh, and, and sort of as, as, uh, as, as b tends to zero here, something much nicer is going to happen. So, so now, uh, if I look at what the conjugated domains look like, you start seeing that what happens is instead of my, uh, in, instead of my dilation sort of collapsing on itself, the, my dilation starts to look more and more like a translation uh, in the, I guess, in the, to, to the right. Uh, and then kind of in the limit, what happens is uh, I, I get a different uh, group element. And now this is, this is something that you, could, that, that you could actually think of as living in PO21. And uh, then this, this sort of limiting domain that I get is really just a copy of hyperbolic two space. Uh, so what's happening is I, I've really sort of transitioned from uh, uh, this sort of quasi hyperbolic generalized cusp. And in the limit, I've recovered a, a, a hyperbolic cusp. Uh, so this is sort of a, an interesting transitional behavior that you can, you can see. Um, and and so, so really what you have to do in order to get nice convergence convergence behavior like this is you often have to, to take, uh, take to, to apply like degenerating families of projective transformations kind of as you go to higher co-dimension walls. Um, and, and so the, the way to kind of understand what's happening here uh, is, is it's really telling you kind of that what the geometry looks like really depends on where you're standing in the manifold. So uh, kind of that first picture that I was showing you where it looked like the manifold was collapsing well, it was because I was viewing the manifold from the wrong point. Like, so if I sort of stand in some, some kind of, like, sort of far away from the, the end of my manifold, uh, what's happening is it's, it's going to start to look to me like the manifold is getting really thin because the, the sort of dilation that I'm doing is going to be starting to glue shorter and shorter things together. So it's going to look to me like my manifold is collapsing. However, if I, if I kind of start walking out the, the end of the cusp as the, the collapse is happening and I walk out at the appropriate rate, if I sort of turn around and start staring back into the manifold, uh, it, it's going to start to look more and more like uh, the cusp of a, of a hyperbolic manifold. So, so really, the, the sort of perspective is that, if you, that you need to be sort of standing very far out in the cusp in order for these, these, these generalized cusps to kind of look like they're converging in the, in, in the right way. Uh, and I guess it, it bears mentioning that you're going to sort of get a similar type of transition uh, every time you have some of the vial chamber data kind of going into a, a higher co-dimensional strata. Um, so th th this is not really unique to, to this, this particular example. Uh, and then I guess I'll, I'll sort of briefly touch on the sort of representation theoretic in interpretation. Uh, so if I think about the, the sort of conjugacy classes of representations that I'll, I mean, this isn't really a character variety because I'm, I'm dealing with, uh, with a kind of nasty group uh, here. Uh, 
Uh, but there, there's sort of a holonomy map that, that takes me from the, the moduli space of generalized cusps into this, uh, this space of conjugacy classes of representations. And, and what I do is I just look at the equivalence class of the map induced by the, by the marking. And uh, th this, this, uh, th this character variety is a really, really non-Hausdorff space, um, really because the, uh, there's lots of reducible representations lying around. And uh, you can sort of interpret this phenomenon as sort of telling you that you, you ha you're having to take uh, limits, or you're, you're having to take families of representations that have different limits uh, to them. So I mean, in one sense, you, you could have a family of representations where as you, as you go to zero, you get one limit, uh, but there's sort of a family of conjugacies so that you, if you conjugate it and then take the limit, uh, you end up getting a different representation that's not conjugate. And, and sort of the reason for this is the, the sort of conjugating mat matrices have to, to degenerate. And we, we sort of saw uh, what these conjugating matrices tend to have to look like. Uh, so this is sort of the algebraic perspective on these, these transitions. Um, so I guess in the, in the last couple of moments, uh, I want to talk about some, some interesting uh, sort of future work that, that one can start to do uh, once one has these uh, generalized cusps in their moduli space at hand. So the first thing that you could try to do is you could try to solve some sort of a realization problem. So uh, you might ask yourself, well, is, is, there a, is, is there a finite volume hyperbolic manifold uh, that I could deform so that the, the cusp looks like my favorite generalized cusp. Um, so in a sense, the answer to that question is almost certainly no, uh, because there are like uncountably, I mean, I don't know, you, you can sort of think about this from the, the perspective of, of hyperbolic geometry. Uh, so th there is sort of a continuous family of, of cusp shapes for, for hyperbolic manifolds, but sort of Mostow rigidity tells you that you can only realize some like countable uh, collection of those because there are only countably many hyperbolic manifolds in, a, in each dimension. Um, but maybe you want to ask yourself, maybe if I could realize some sort of dense subset of, of the space of all generalized cusps by, by deforming uh, properly convex manifolds. Uh, and, and sort of surprisingly little is known about th this realization problem. Uh, so in, in low dimensions, there are some examples known. So I think in, in dimension two, uh, by work of, of uh, Choi and, and Choi Goldman, uh, you, you can actually construct uh, examples with every possible type of, uh, of generalized cusp end. Uh, and then in, in higher dimensions, um, so I, I, I was able to, to construct some uh, quasi-hyperbolic uh, structures on the figure eight knot complement in some work I did a, a handful of years ago. Um, and then recently, uh, Jeff Danziger, Gaysan, and I, uh, Gaysan Lee, and I were, were able to construct some uh, diagonalizable uh, deformations uh, on, on the figure eight and, a, and another on a larger class of manifolds. Um, but, but currently, I, I think that there is not a construction uh, that's known for, uh, for, for sort of arbitrary uh, generalized cusps, although I've, I've heard some, some good ideas in the last week. So I, I have hope that something like this might be able to be done. Um, but, but by and large, right now, sort of, especially in higher dimensions, there's, there's essentially nothing known. Uh, I guess one thing I can say is that there's, there's a, a, a sort of bending construction that Ludovic Marquis and I were able to analyze that, that sort of showed that there's, there's one type of, of cusp that you can always realize in every dimension, uh, namely the ones corresponding to the sort of co-dimension one, or sorry, the, the dimension one walls of the, the vial chamber. Uh, but other than that, there, there's not really much known. Uh, another idea that I think would be kind of interesting uh, that I don't really know how to do is to kind of try to use this space of generalized cusp structures as the basis of some sort of Fenchel Nielsen coordinates on uh, the space of all uh, properly convex manifolds. So if you kind of think about w w how do a Fenchel Nielsen coordinates work for surfaces, well, you, you have some coordinates that uh, sort of describe the like lengths of boundary curves, uh, and you should sort of think about those as giving you some sort of data about the boundary uh, of some submanifolds. And then you want to kind of understand uh, like how, how do these, these uh, parameters sort of interact with each other? How can you sort of glue things together? Uh, and, and so there, there's kind of a, a picture you might have as well. Maybe, maybe, you have a, uh, um, maybe you have a properly convex three manifold. Uh, and, and there's a, a very nice theorem of, of Yves Benoit that says under some, some mild hypotheses that you can sort of cut this into a, a bunch of pieces, 
Uh, and these, these pieces sort of turn out to have structures that, that ha have generalized cusp ends. And so you, you might sort of think that you could use this, this uh, to, to sort of parameterize the space of all convex projective structures. Um, and then one last thing that might be kind of interesting uh, is, is to sort of understand how the mapping class group of the, the torus sort of interacts with this uh, generalized cusp picture. Uh, so, I mean, I guess this would really be thought of as, as trying to understand the space of unmarked uh, uh, cusps. Uh, and so these are these are a few questions that I think uh, would be good for people to be thinking about in the in the future. Um, so so thank you very much for for listening today. Yeah, I'm definitely not walking up there. <laughs> not even known if you can realize all possible like cusp shapes like all possible like unipotent cusp shapes on uh, on a torus. I mean because without, without deforming you'll only get a dense subset But I mean, I, I guess you could maybe envision like a rich deformation theory where you could sort of do a properly convex deformation. I mean, so you, you could start with this like dense, I mean, you could start with a point that actually, in this dense set that actually does come from the holonomy of some hyperbolic manifold. And maybe, uh, if you're lucky, you could deform that to a strictly convex structure on that same manifold that, that where, where you're actually deforming the cusp shape. But it's still strictly convex. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, you could you could imagine something like that happening, but I have no idea whether or not it does. I guess I was more interested in, in the cusp becoming non uh, non hyperbolic, uh, non Well, so given recent conversations that I've had, uh, I'm starting to believe that uh, you could realize any element of the like closed vial chamber, but it's not clear to me like 
or your favorite element of the closed vial chamber if you could realize every possible like lattice in the corresponding V group. So I'm, I'm much more confident about maybe that re restricted version of the realization problem. 